Hi, I'm Betsy Rosenberg, and I am very happy to welcome you back to another edition of Green TV. I'm beginning these first couple of weeks um, on this platform, which I'm very happy to be on because I did radio for so many years, first uh, for CBS and then left to do environmental news shows, news and views you can use. Uh, but TV is more fun. I get to see the people I'm interviewing. I'll try not to use my hands too much. <laughs> and I am really looking forward to my next interview because I've tried to bring back my friends from way back when, when I started doing green media uh, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, one of them is Kevin Danaher. He's someone I remember from Green Festival, from the Global Exchange in San Francisco, but also from the anti-war protests that I attended a few of. And I was thinking of him as we just recently passed 9-11 and as we just recently got out of Afghanistan, sort of messily, uh, but so many years later, my goodness, and what did we accomplish? Kevin came to mind. And um, right when I was thinking about him, he posted on LinkedIn an article, an op-ed piece he had written and was published in the Washington Post in the days after 9-11. And so that confirmed that this was a good person to talk to at this moment that we're in, really the intersection of, you know, end of one war, got to ramp up the war against the climate and or to save the climate. Uh, and, and just, you know, where we are in terms of this country and of course, post COVID, uh, did we learn enough lessons from this pandemic? We're still in it, of course, but it just seems like this, this has got to be uh, a trans, transitional moment. Let's hope it is to wake people up to what's not working, what has not been working. And I guess because I had this strong feeling, and I know I wasn't alone, I was marching with other demonstrators that we should not be going into Iraq, we should not be going into Afghanistan. And and, and look, look what it wrought. And uh, why did we not learn from Vietnam? And, and I know the whole war thing is a much more complex subject area than we either have time to go into, nor am I really the best person to talk about it. But I do know that we have, um, it's, it's just cost us so much in lives first and foremost, in the countries that we invade, thinking we're gonna make them into a democracy. And just at this, at this crossroads moment, as we look back at 9-11, and that, of course, had some connection to oil. I just thought, Kevin, you would be a, because you've been sort of at that intersection, in my mind, between activism, environmentalism, uh, and, and just having strong opinions uh, as a leader that I think we're absolutely right on. So welcome to Green TV. Well, thanks for having me, Betsy. I sure do appreciate it. All true, all true. <laughs> uh, so let's go back to 20 years ago. Obviously, we were all in shock. Uh, what prompted you to write an article that was about what we call this. If we call this a war, do we call this a crime? What was the inspiration to make that distinction? Well, actually, I was on my way to San Francisco airport uh, that morning to give a talk uh, in Colorado at a university. And uh, they, the police were turning us away at the airport. And I realized, uh oh, something's up here. I went home, I turned on the TV, I saw it. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, the leader, whoever did it, the leaders of our country are going to use this as a way to find a replacement for the communist threat. The communist threat was why when I was a kid, they would get us out and do duck and cover drills, go out in the hallway, crouch against the wall, put your jacket over your head. And even at nine years old, I realized a jacket's not going to protect me from an atom bomb. This is a training exercise in Ooh, fear, same thought. <laughs> terrorism, right? Scare the hell out of people and they'll keep funding this massive so-called national security state, the Pentagon, the CIA, et cetera. Well, when the Soviet Union and communism collapsed in 1989, 1990, the people running the empire have to find a replacement threat and Islamic fundamentalism fits the bill. There's a whole racist element to it. So what I wrote in the Washington, piece, Washington Post piece was to say, look, we can create the narrative in one of two ways, war or crime. If we do war, it leads to the same stupidity that led to the war in Vietnam and all this bombing of poor countries. If we define it as crime, we use our crime investigation uh, resources and journalism to find who did it and prosecute them and put them in jail and make an example. The problem is the International Criminal Court does not have the United States as a member or support. And it goes way back to 
the U.S. mining the ports of Nicaragua when the Sandinistas were coming to power and all this other criminal activity, the United States government is not a member of the International Criminal Court. What, what has happened in the last 20 years, of, of, as we have been in Afghanistan, has been a tragedy. It's been really a waste, and that's what got me into this. I hate waste, whether it's trash talk, talking about wasting food, water, energy, resources, or waste of, of, of lives and, and money and time and resources, resources, resources. And all I can think, you know, in the last two decades that I've been covering climate change, you know, with those trillions that we spent in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, what what could it have done? Um, and here we find ourselves in 2021, where it almost feels like, you know, the, the window is closing to act not just on climate, but all of our ecosystems are in collapse. And yeah. it, it's, it's, I just wanted to, I guess, connect with somebody who shares that sense of deep frustration, and we're not alone by any means, but I know that you know, in the beginning, you were sure that that was the wrong thing to do. And so was I and the other thousands of people that marched with us in San Francisco. And now that we're closing that chapter and, and have to open up the climate crisis chapter, just thought uh, it would be good to talk also right after 9-11. It's all connected, isn't it? Isn't it in the end all about oil? Yeah. There's a very interesting contradiction in this, and that is the Pentagon is the largest polluter on planet Earth but it is also a pioneer in green technology. They're promoting solar energy and wind energy, developing boots that as you walk, the pressure of the boots recharges the battery pack of the radio guys so they can shrink the size of the battery pack. They're doing biofuels, they're doing electric vehicles, they're doing all sorts of stuff. Now, granted, that's within the context of an imperial army. I actually have a short piece in my latest book, which you can download for free. It's a PDF download at kevindanaher.org. And I have a section in there about the US military and all the stuff that's going on that's green. And I have this little proposal saying, look, we have over 800 military bases around the planet in over a hundred countries. We could convert those into eco universities training local people in green enterprise, organic agriculture, renewable energy, green building, biofuels, and that would make people like us. We would create entrepreneurialism at the local level. We would improve the living standards of people. Dropping bombs on people, we dropped 81,000 bombs on Afghanistan. It's the size of Texas. If you dropped 81,000 bombs on Texas, would the people of Texas love you or hate you? This is really simple. So this is up to us as U.S. citizens to undo the empire and get at the roots of all this violence that's baked into our culture. And that goes along with being kind to Mother Earth. She's giving us all these dope slaps with every climate situation collapsing. What you see in the, in the, in the video behind me is a cave that I built in the side of an 18 acre forest that I bought up here in Quincy, California. And the reason I situated here is because we have three major catchment, snow catchment, water catchment areas up above us. We're at 3,400 feet at five, 6,000 feet. We have three big catchment areas. We're always gonna have water. If you look at the boundary of Plumas County, P-L-U-M-A-S, it's feathers in Spanish, you will see that the boundary is drawn around a watershed, the three branches of the Feather River, the largest watershed in the Sierra Mountains. And I picked this particular spot because there's a 40 acre national forest piece up above my hill and it's in between the college and the airport. So I knew in a fire, it would be heavily defended. The Dixie fire came within a few miles, but thanks to 5,000 firefighters, the fire went around us to the north. So I, I forgot we, to mention that you wrote 14 books and I'm very glad that you were staying, <laughs> but I'm sure not everybody was because that's what happens. One person's lucky, across the street, they lost everything in, well, fire, in floods. I, in I tried to I tried to be ahead of the curve. I wrote my first piece about the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in the mid 1970s saying, look, these institutions control the global economy. We have an abundant global economy with plenty of food and we have millions of children starving to death from hunger at the same time. Capitalism is the problem. So this crisis 
allows us to say, wait a minute, let's shift from an extractive economic model where a tree standing has no value. It's only when you kill it that it has value. A fish swimming alive has no value. It's only when you kill it that it has value. That kind of an extractive model will destroy the planet's ability to support us. It won't destroy the planet. When we're gone, the planet's gonna do great. Better. But contrast that now to the regenerative economy. Paul Hawken and other people are focusing on, let's make the soil more fertile in our gardening. And I garden, it's possible to do. You can add fertility as you grow food and even make money, right? I'm not gonna say what crops I grow, but some <laughs> crops are thousand dollars a pound, you know? So we are this be can be done. About. We're going to be talking a lot about regenerative, the whole regenerative everything, farming, agriculture. We had John Rulock on uh, talking about that, and I'll get Paul Hawken on. He was on. Um, Paul's Eco great. Friend. John's a great yeah. friend of mine there's, too. There's so many great people. Bill McKibben just launched Third Act to get people over 50, 60. I know a few. <laughs> I, I read everything Bill together. writes. Everything he writes is worth reading. Absolutely, I agree. I just saw something on. Uh, I don't know what it was, CNN, some, something was on television as I was making dinner last night and it was about the famine in Madagascar. And it was so, they didn't, they didn't mince words. And it wasn't one of these ads where they're trying to just make you cry to give money, you know, whether it's for animals or starving children, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but it was an actual news story. And when they said that, the, this woman was saying that her child is so hungry that he's, he, that he's crying and the crying makes him faint. I just said to my husband, I don't think we should eat dinner. You know, I think we should send it there. And of course we can't, but what that, the reason I bring that up is because of our fossil fuel, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, those in America, the biggest personal footprint per capita, it's harming the people who least contributed, who can least afford to deal with it first and worst. And I think of all the issues that this brings up this climate crisis and it is connected to everything else. Uh, that's the saddest thing in the world. But while we're, I'm living in Texas and my neighbors are fighting my solar panels, children are starving <laughs> to death. It's not funny <laughs> in Madagascar. I'll write a book someday. I could do a reality TV show. Welcome to Texas. Who's my governor? Who's my senator? Um, yeah. Let him move to Texas. That's another story. But I'm doing the best I can. But don't we'll move to Florida. <laughs> you know what? It's, I don't know what would be worse, but it's good to get out of the bubble. I grew up in the Bay Area, went to Cal and lived in Marin and thought I was going to be there forever. My husband got tired of the taxes. So here we are. But I digress. The point is, this is just so inequitable and it, it needs to be fixed. And I was glad that they had that on, even though I couldn't watch it through dinner, um, because people need to understand these connections. And that's what's not being made. Um, and that's where my heart really goes. Um, and I just wonder how you see, where do you see us going from here? If you were president of the United States, what would you, what would your top three priorities be to not keep repeating the sins, I would say, and crimes of just even the last couple of decades that we've been, you know, aware and active, you may be a little bit longer, uh, to, to right the wrongs, and there's so many. And do you think we learned enough from this pandemic to realize that A, nature's the boss, B, things can go south really fast overnight, and see, this is my focus, if media focuses on something and treats it like an emergency, guess what? People change their behavior. And yeah. that's a big part of the problem is mainstream news outlets, especially the TV news networks have not done their job and have all but ignored the climate, et cetera, crises. And um, we just have so much to do so quickly. What does Kevin, or Kevin Danaher think we should do first? Well, the, what people need to understand about the corporate media is the product being sold is not the tires and toothpaste in the ads. It's your brain and my brain and everybody else's consciousness who watches that's being sold to the corporate advertisers. We are the product. We're not the consumer. We're the product being sold to the real consumers, which is the corporate advertisers. So what, one of the things I do is I point out to people. Still running fossil fuel ads in the middle of the hurricane coverage. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. I, I do this thing with people where I say, look, our best science shows that when all the ice on the planet melts, which it appears to be doing, okay. it, ocean, it raises ocean levels over 200 feet. The whole state of Florida goes underwater. 
And people always respond by saying, oh, well, that's off in the future. Oh, so screw the grandchildren. Let's be bad ancestors. If you said to people, should we, should we be good ancestors or bad ancestors? Most people are going to say we should be good ancestors. So on the positive side, there's a whole wake up going on around the planet. People realizing we can't keep burning fossil fuels. You see an economic transition point where you're starting to be able to make better profits saving nature than destroying it. That's a tipping point. We have the triple bottom line model that B corporations and uh, other companies are saying, well, wait a minute, we have to do social equity, environmental restoration, not just preservation, and make a profit because at Global Exchange, we had stores and we do tours and publish books. We have to make money if we want to pay people salaries and pay for medical, dental and all that kind of stuff. So we've got an awakening going on that the standard capitalist model of let's just kill and extract and mine and burn up. You have fossil fuels that took 200 million years to create and we're burning them in 200 years. Anytime where you go that far out of alignment with history, you're gonna create problems. So I try to focus people on all the green stuff that's going on, the green enterprise, the triple bottom line, the youth, the youth who are out in the streets. Greta Thunberg, if somebody had said that an Asperger's teenager could have millions of followers and change the course of history, I would have said, well, what are you talking about? What are you smoking? You know, I want to buy some. And here she <laughs> is. <laughs> She's got this massive following. So there's a lot to be encouraged by. Yes, but when I hear people my age, fellow parents, um, boomers, whatever, say, oh, just let that generation take care of it. They get it more busy. <laughs> and I say, wait a minute, what, what is Greta saying? They're saying, uh, listen to the science. I say, yes. And what else is she saying? Uh, I don't know. I said, they're screaming at us to say, do everything you can as adults so we can stay in school and have a, a chance, a hope to have a future that we can survive in, let alone thrive. And, and that's what I want to get out, that this is everybody's job and not to dump on them. And at least we should give it a good college try to do our best now that we know what we know, even though we've known for a while. And it tells us that one of the key things we need to focus on is courage. We need courage. We can't chicken out on this. I'm up in a forest every day where there's bears and mountain lions. And I, I confess, there are times where I hear a sound and it might be a deer or a squirrel, but I turn around really quickly. That sympathetic side of the nervous system, the fight or flight, what we now know from the best brain science is we can cultivate the parasympathetic side of our nervous system, which is the rest and digest cuddle, make love. We can rewire our own brains through positive talk to ourselves and others. There's a, 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 it's called automatic negative thinking, ant. We need to kill the ants, automatic negative thinking of, oh, I can't do this. Oh, we're doomed. That's not going to help. I did a lot of teaching in college and high school, and I would have kids say, oh, I'm not good at writing. And I would say, don't say that. Everybody can be a writer. It's about training and commitment and putting in the time. Well, you know, what we're also up against is, is optimism. Too many people say, oh, well, we'll, we'll figure it out. Technology will save us. That's just as bad, right, as the ant theory. And by the way, be careful because we're hearing about more and more animals coming into human habitats, um, bears, you know, because it's probably because of the drought, right? They're looking for water. They're looking for food. And the fires. We had just the other night here in the middle of town, right by the courthouse, I see four stags, four male deers walking like a parade across Main Street past the courthouse, and they're looking for good, well, well watered gardens to munch on. You know, I thought, I've I had wanted to speak to the authorities. <laughs> the yeah, authorities. I've had deer right outside my window grazing on whatever they could find. So, got them in this, my backyard too, in uh, Hill Country. This is of one of the big things that we can get people to realize is we are not separate from nature. We are part of nature, and we are a species that can foresee its own extinction. Yeah. Most most species haven't done that. And we are the most invasive species. 
But the positive side of that is because we're so adaptable, we're so resilient, whether it's the coldest part of Alaska or the hottest part of a desert, we humans figure out ways to survive. So we're going to figure out ways, but a key point of that is to not just rely on technology, because if wind and solar are done as big, massive projects, that means either big corporations or big government and local people are cut out of it. That's not the way to go. We have microgrid technology. We have small wind. We can put solar on every home. There's an interesting case in Gainesville, Florida. They did what the German government did where they said, look, if you trick out your building, residential or commercial with solar, and you put more back into the grid than you take out, we will pay you a premium on that electricity. They had a two year window for signups. It filled up in two months because people realized my property can be generating income for me. So that's a simple policy move that could be done in every state and every city. I think uh, the American people, at least for sure half, you know, get that climate change is real. They want to know what to do. They want to be part of the solution. And it's, you know, the gatekeepers in corporate media have, I think, been a big part of the problem by not informing people. Because after all, if you don't see it on CNN, and for many years you, I, I watched and monitored, I'm doing a book about it someday, barely mentioned climate change. I get so excited when I saw it mentioned. Now, after the IPCC report came out, I couldn't even keep up going back and forth between CNN and MSNBC, but then it goes away. And it, it's the next day after IPC, it was Cuomo and COVID. And now it's COVID and Delta. And then it was the earthquake in Haiti and then Afghanistan exit, Afghanistan exit. And they don't ever seem to get back to putting this front and center. And what else is gonna be good if we don't have a habitable planet? And that's what needs to really get out there because there are so many solutions. We'll never run out of people who are working in the green front lines and that's exactly solutionaries that. solutionaries my show is the green front the green front lines and that was 12 15 years ago so i'm glad you're still at it i'm still at it i'm back at it and i am a woman on emission i am determined to let ignorance die on all these important <laughs> environmental issues that you know are not for everybody as i say only for those who eat breathe or drink everybody else go about your business so well, I'm, <laughs> I'm working i'm working on a game called significa it's the opposite of trivial pursuits. It's facts that actually matter. Like in the recent Hurricane Ida, what state had the most deaths? And the answer is New Jersey. And you say, New Jersey? Yeah, they drown in their cars and in basement apartments. Well, who's living in basement apartments? It's low income people, it's the poor. So you have a class impact on a global level as you said, the third world countries that didn't contribute to climate change are getting hit the worst. All those Pacific Island countries like the Maldives and uh, Vanuatu and all, they're going to have to move off of their home where they've been for thousands of generations. Marshall so Island. This, Island. Is, this is wake up calls that, yeah. that Mother Nature is giving us these dope slaps and we're not going to be able to ignore it. And you're seeing that a lot of people now are waking up and recognizing we got to pull up our belts and really get to work here. The level of suffering that was finally televised, you know, in the wake of Ida from Louisiana to New Jersey to the basement apartments in Manhattan was so, even to me, um, dramatic and alarming. And, and I hope that really got people, you know, who don't necessarily think of themselves as environmentally, you know, plugged in or climate concerned, see that it, this is real. It's arrived, although it arrived, I said it on my radio show during Katrina, 16 years ago, climate change has arrived. And then it was kind of funny to see the news anchors going, oh, climate change is here. It's like, where have you been? You haven't yep. been. But to see the human suffering, and again, always, almost always those who least contributed to it, but anybody, um, better be a wake up call because we're only, it's only gonna get yep. worse. We're only gonna get more ferocious and frequent extreme weather events, fires, floods, hurricanes, tor tornadoes, derechos, um, we had snow again, like there's, you need new words for what was no apocalypse, what we're going through, but it's not funny. And I think you see it in the virus too. people who are anti science and not accepting simple things like wear a mask, 
get the vaccine. The reason that we don't have polio and smallpox anymore is because of vaccination. It wasn't about herd immunity. It was about vaccination. People don't realize one of the reasons George Washington beat the British was he vaccinated his troops against smallpox and a whole bunch of British soldiers died of smallpox. So this stuff is proven technology and people who ignore it, you know, 99% of the people dying from the virus didn't get vaccinated. So there's a Darwinian element to this. If you look at the counties with the worst deaths, it's Trump counties, the ones who voted for Trump. So <laughs> unfortunate, but true, you ignore science, you pay a price. Those who ignore the past are condemned to repeat the mistakes. And it seems to be that the you know COVID crowd and climate deniers are the same, the anti-vaxxers and climate deniosaurs, same crowd. It's all. It's about education and not trying to sound like a snooty white environmentalist. But let's face it, and that's why I am not giving up on this because once people know, you can't unknow it. And and no. the fact that we have not done a good job in this country, and I do blame mainstream media, my broadcast news industry, especially some of the newspapers have certainly done a good job, but only in the last five six years. The Guardian, New York Times, Washington Post, because I've been watching this. Um, it, it's got to be treated as a all hands on deck emergency. That's the only hope. And yeah. I appreciate you, all, all your activism um, hanging in there. Like like I said, once you know it, you can't unknow it. So we're we're, we're condemned. <laughs> well, I get I get regular practice up here because the majority of voters in Plumas County voted for Trump. But if you want to get your car fixed or your chainsaw is broken, these are the guys who are, you're going to go to to fix it. So I engage them in in solidarity conversation, listening to them. I want to hear what their evidence is and I treat them with respect and we build a relationship. And once we have that relationship, we can do all sorts of stuff together and we don't have to argue about Trump versus Biden. We can deal with how do we prepare our forests for wildfire? How do we preserve our water resources? And we're on the same boat and we agree. One of the things I say, because now I live in Texas where it's not the Bay Area, definitely not in uh, Tiburon anymore. Um, I meet people all the time who clearly have one point of view. A woman was cleaning my teeth the other day and her son is in the military and she made a comment that made me know which side she's on. And I started to say something, but her hand was in my mouth. So <laughs> you're gonna lose this one. Just take this as a pass, Betsy. Right, um, yeah. I, I go into restaurants and they serve you water with a straw. And I go into my, I'm a big girl. Somehow I got to this point in my life without needing straws. Why don't you only serve them if people ask for them? Oh, we don't know. It's just how we've always done it. My point is we all need to be ambassadors and speak up. And I think yep. it's more efficient for me to be on green TV, which hopefully will be everywhere soon than going one person at a time. Because you know what, I'm only, there's, there's many of us, but it's, it's not the most efficient way to get the word out that the reality and, and the big problem is our disinformation epidemic, but we don't yeah. have time to go into that. But that is obviously at the root of a lot of this. Well, if there was a God and she came down and she said, okay, you can either have guns and money or facts and moral authority. You wouldn't take guns and money. Guns and money is currently what's in power. And we need to refocus our efforts on replacing guns and money as the dominant values with facts and moral authority. Not to mention, not to mention, and we will not dwell because we do have to wrap up, I promise, but I need to vent every now and then. And this week, of course, with the whole Texas abortion abomination, you know, how hypocritical can you get when you're saying, I have the freedom to not wear a mask, to give somebody a deadly disease, to not get vaccinated, but I'm going to tell you, not me, because I'm past that childbearing age, but a woman, how to run her life and what to do with her uterus. Like, is that the height or the low point of hypocrisy? There's got to be another word. Hypocrisy doesn't touch it, right? It gives hypocrisy a bad name. <laughs> there you go. On that note, well, thank you, Kevin. You did not disappoint. I knew you'd have a lot to say. Stay safe. Watch out for bears. We need you. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.